morning. How's everyone doing this morning? It's, um, it's a pleasure to bring you God's Word this morning. I love that song that we just sung, especially talking about Jesus Christ being our gracious Savior. It's such an amazing thing that Jesus Christ is indeed gracious. He was so gracious that he came to this earth in order to save us, to become one of us. It's, it's a great, great, wonderful mystery that we all get to be a part of. Well, welcome to Summit Church. My name is Michael Husky, and it's a pleasure to bring you the Word of God this morning. We've been working our way through the book of Acts. So if you have your Bibles, please turn over to Acts, and we're going to be looking at chapter 17 this morning. We're going to be looking at verses 16 through 21. 16 through 21 of chapter 17. So a little backdrop, Paul and Silas and Timothy are on the second missionary journey. So they've been traveling around and planting churches in places that have really never heard the gospel before. And we know that they ran into problems everywhere that they went, including the town that we just talked about last week, which was the city of Berea. They ran into persecution there, and Paul decided that it was time to move on. And so he left on his own and left instruction for Silas and Timothy to follow later. He probably left them behind in order to help this church to get off to a better start. Now we talked last time about how that the people in Berea was, uh, was, was people that we could learn something from, right? They all had some really great qualities, and it should be something that we should all aspire to have qualities that deal with how to study the Bible and how to compare what's being said in the name of God to Scripture. Now, if you remember, Paul, he had built up quite the reputation on this journey. He was actually accused of upsetting the entire world back in verse 17, or I'm sorry, verse 6. And that <laughs> reputation would continue to shine forth as he moves into the city of Athens that we're going to be looking at this morning. So please stand for the reading of God's Word. Starting in verse 16. Now while, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him as he was observing the city full of idols. So he was reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be present. And also some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers were conversing with him. Some were saying, what would this idle babbler wish to say? Others, he seems to be a proclaimer of strange deities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Arabicus, saying, May we know what this new teaching is which you are proclaiming, for you are bringing some strange things to our ears. So we want to know what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the strangers visiting there used to spend their time in nothing other than telling or hearing something new. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful to be able to come together as your people to hear your word, God, and I pray that you would speak to us through your word, and I pray, God, that you would use me to edify your church and to preach this clearly to your people, God. God, I pray that just as you are gracious to us, as we sung about earlier, that we would also be grateful people for what it is that you have done for us that you sent your one and only Son, God, into this world so that we could be made right before a perfect and a holy God. Help us to be grateful people. Help us, God, to be hungry for your word, God, and to be hungry just to be the people that you've called us to be, your bride, God, and to look forward to your soon return. We love you. We thank you so much. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. So Athens was one of the most celebrated cities in the ancient world. 
It was really the place that you thought of when you thought about literature, about the arts, about education, especially over philosophical ideas. Philosophy was an extremely important part of the education system during this time. Now, a question that a lot of Christians may ask today is, well, what about philosophy in our time, right? Is, uh, is there anything wrong with philosophy today? And the answer is really no, there, there's not, as long as you use it as a tool to help understand the Bible and God in a greater way. In fact, the Apostle John used philosophy in John chapter 1 with the mentioning of the Logos. John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, the Logos, and the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. So the Greek word for word is Logos. Logos was not invented by the Apostle John. It was a philosophical concept that philosophers had used for many years trying to understand where that all things came from. And then Paul uses philosophy here in Athens whenever he addresses the idol to the unknown God. And we'll talk about that the next time that I preach. So great philosophers were held in very high regard during this time. And Athens was the philosophical center of the world. It's where that you would want to go if you were a student of philosophy. And because philosophy was so important, it held a very high influence over religious matters. In fact, religion was largely based on philosophy, like we briefly mentioned with the word logos. And so Athens was also looked at as one of the religious centers of the world. Now let's look back at verse 16. It says, Now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him as he was observing the city full of idols. So Paul was waiting for Timothy and Silas. He had fled here, and his plan was probably to regroup, to get maybe just a little bit of rest, a little bit of comfort for just a little while, in a place where people weren't trying to kill him. Athens was one of the places where he felt maybe he could do that. But God had another plan for him, as we can see. Now, Athens was not only the philosophical center of the world, but it was also the most tolerant city in the world. It had to be because it gave allegiance to almost every god that was invented by man. And just to make sure that they were tolerant of everyone, we mentioned earlier that they even had an idol to an unknown god. Paul is going to be dealing with that later when he stands before these philosophers to proclaim the one true God. Now, I think it's funny that in today's world, the word tolerance is what so many people seem to shout the loudest. But today, tolerance is really a two-sided sword. You see, the people that shout it only want tolerance for what they want to believe, which by definition makes it really no tolerance at all, because absolute tolerance is really an absolute impossibility. When a Christian shows the reality of truth, you see, the other side of their sword is swung at us because truth is one thing that they cannot tolerate. Give me anything but truth is the cry of the world. And that's why that Christians are also, are also deemed very often as being haters and sometimes even bigots. You see, the world has a funny idea of what love is. I'll say funny, but really I should say twisted and corrupted. Because you see, if you love someone, then you really want them to know the truth, don't you? That's what Christians do. We give truth. And that truth is not what the world wants to hear. And so they hate us for it. Unless we bend to their standard. And that's why that so many churches today have gone astray. Because they give into what the world wants them to be. Because they don't want to be hated over the truth. But that's really the most unloving thing that we can do, isn't it? 
to compromise or to bend or to assimilate with with the, the world whenever an eternal soul, an actual human being's life is hanging in the balance on what they truly believe. And to do that only really affirms the lies that they believe rather than loving them and showing them the truth that they really don't want to hear. We can't compromise the truth. We can only proclaim it and believe it. And you know, that's something that we don't make up either. We don't make up the truth. It's the word of God that we proclaim to the world. That's the standard that God himself has set and we must be submissive to proclaim because God is God, right? God is God. We are simply messengers that's just telling the world what the creator of the universe has said to us through the Bible. So we stand here on the word of God. That's one of the things that we always want to do. And we see here in our text that Paul's spirit was being provoked within him as he was observing a city full of idols. Now, Scripture teaches that a person is a dichotomy, not a trichotomy. And what that means is that a person is made up of body and soul, right? Or spirit. Those words are used interchangeably in Scripture, spirit or soul. We don't believe in what's called a trichotomy, meaning body, soul, and spirit. And there's reasons for that. It has to do with doctrine and also some heretical movements that are out there today. And we see here that Paul's spirit was being provoked. Now, what does that mean? It actually says it was being provoked, which indicates that he's not the one that was doing that, that he was being provoked by someone else, right? Now, one of the greatest things that happens to the child of God happened after the ascension of Jesus Christ. Jesus said that he was going to leave us with a comforter. He says this in John 14, 16. This is Jesus speaking. He says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it, did not, it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. Now, the word helper is used here in this text, but other versions may say comforter. The Greek word is parakletos. Parakletos. This is referring to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God. He's the third member of the Trinity, and he's a person. He's not a force like some people try to teach today. The Holy Spirit is God, and he is a person. He lives in each child of God. And one of the things that he does for us is he comforts us. But that's not all that he does. He also provokes us like we see happening here with Paul. The Holy Spirit wouldn't let Paul take a vacay, right? He couldn't just go out and do some sightseeing. His spirit was provoked because of all the idols that he saw in the city, which reminded him that these people were desperately lost and that they needed a savior. They needed to hear the truth. Now, John Calvin says something that I think is, um, is very applicable for all of history. He says, the human heart is a perpetual idol factory. The human heart is a perpetual idol factory. Now, that's true. All that the world really wants to do is chase after idols, not necessarily idols of wood and stone, but idols of money, of fame, of status, of reputation, and of power, or idols of entertainment and pleasure or material possessions. Something else that we should be aware of, though, is even Christians also deal with this very problem, with this very issue. It's something that's hard for us to deal with sometimes. It's so easy for us to get distracted. It's easy for us to chase after the wrong things. You see, really the definition of an idol is making something to be larger than God. Something that you chase after more than you chase after him. Something that you want to spend your time with 
your energy, your money on, rather than on God himself. Now that's something that's, that's painful for us to hear, isn't it? But you know, we're all guilty of this from time to time. It's really so easy for us to get caught up in this life, to get caught up in money, to get caught up in chasing after some lifestyle that we see that some other person has and that we want, or entertainment and things like that. That's why the God calls the church a body. God calls us a body because we need each other, each one of us. We need one another. A lone Christian or a lone wolf Christian will not survive. Because you see, we need each other and we need solid biblical teaching. We need to hear the gospel every single day of our lives. We need to hear that there's more to this life than just ourselves. That we're a part of something that's much bigger than who we are as individuals. That this life has one purpose and one purpose only. And that is to glorify God with everything that we do. You know, that's how that idolatry is killed, by the way, is learning to glorify God in all things. I'm talking to myself. I'm talking to you. And I'm talking to anybody that will listen. Glorify God in all things. And that will kill your idols. That's our remedy. Let's look at verse 17. So he was reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles, and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be present. So we can see here that Paul went to the synagogue to preach, and that was really his practice, and we've seen that over and over again. He went to the synagogue because he had an audience there. He was reasoning with them in the synagogue. That means that he was showing them the truth of the gospel. Now, we talked a few weeks ago about how important it was for the Christian to learn how to use reason, right? Because you see, Christianity is a very reasonable faith. In fact, it's impossible for Christianity to not be reasonable because God is the one that has created all things, including reason. And God is perfect, just like what he created was, right? Just like what he does. So we use reason whenever the world is trying to, to come against us with some of these idolatries and things that they try to use against us, right? We show them the truth of the gospel, that Jesus Christ is the only way to be made right before a holy God. And that's what Paul was doing in the synagogue. But we can see here that it wasn't only the synagogue that he was doing this, but also in the marketplace, right? And that's something that we should also do to find opportunities to share the gospel everywhere that we go. And you know, if you really are serious about that, one of the th ways to start is to pray for God to give you an opportunity. If you pray for God to give you an opportunity to share the gospel with someone, I can almost guarantee you that he'll give you that opportunity. Let's look at verse 18. Verse 18 says, And also some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers were conversing with him. Some were saying, What would this idle babbler wish to say? Others, he seems to be a proclaimer of strange deities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. So the Epicureans and the Stoics represent two of three of the most influential philosophical schools during this time. The third was the Cynics. The Epicureans' main school of thought focused on the belief that pleasure and the avoidance of pain was the ultimate purpose of life. That's why that we exist. To receive a maximum amount of pleasure and a minimum amount of pain. They were what we would call materialists. They believed in the gods of Greece, but they did not believe that the gods intervened or even bothered with the affairs of mankind. They taught that when a person dies, that you just cease 
to exist. That's one of the reasons that, that they had this reaction that we see whenever Paul was preaching about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, the Stoics were on the other side of the coin. They taught that self-mastery was the highest purpose to why that we exist. They saw it as really the highest form of virtue. You see, they taught that self-mastery was learning to be indifferent to pleasure or pain. That the highest goal was really to feel nothing. To feel nothing. That you really can't change anything. So you just take whatever comes your way, you deal with it, and then you move on without letting it affect you whatsoever. They also believe in what we would call pantheism. Pantheism is a religion that focuses on, uh, it's also a philosophical belief that says that the universe, nature, and reality are all identical to a supreme entity or deity. So in other words, to make that simple, simply put, they believe that nature is God. I think we can probably relate to that consider, considering where we live at today, right? A lot of people believe that here in this very valley. So in, in simple terms, these philosophical views are really still what the world believes today. People either tend to be Epicureans and believe in some kind of materialism or some form of what we would call hedonism, or they are stoic and they want to feel nothing and let nothing bother them whatsoever. Now, I find that interesting that people really never seem to ever reach these goals. Not with a sound mind, anyway. That's because we're created different than that, right? We are created for a different purpose. A purpose that the world cannot invent or materialize through philosophy or anything else. Because we exist to glorify God. That's the chief end of man. And we chase if we chase after any other thing in order to try to find fulfillment or satisfaction in anything in the world, then all we're going to be left with is only emptiness. Because you see, our purpose is much bigger than that. Our purpose is much bigger than ourselves and even the people around us. When we make things about us or even other people and we leave God out of the equation, we will never find fulfillment. And you know, the world understands that. They see that, this lack of fulfillment, and they're always chasing after it. So they chase after the next idea or the next thing that they believe could give them some kind of satisfaction or some kind of relief. But really what they're doing is they're just grasping the air with their hands, right? There's nothing there. There's really nothing that can ever truly satisfy them because they're chasing after something created rather than, than chasing after the one who created it, right? The creator himself, God. They, chat, they also chase after ideas rather than chasing after the answer, right? The answer. They're always chasing after the wrong thing. Now, something else we see here in this text is these people called Paul an idol babbler. Now, that is really a great insult, especially if you look at the Greek here. The Greek word here literally means seed pecker. That's what, that's what they were calling Paul, a seed pecker. It's, return, it's referring to a bird just running around on the ground pecking seeds that's laying around wherever they're scattered at, right? So they saw Paul's teaching this way. You know, people still see Christianity as an unintellectual faith. That's because they've made some assumptions, some false assumptions, I might say, rather than taking the time to carefully look at it. In fact, the Christian faith is both the most simplistic faith as well as the most complex. Because what we are is we are a finite creature who's trying to understand an infinite God. But at the same time, that infinite God has made a way of salvation that is so simple 
that even a child can understand it. They also said here that Paul was a proclaimer of strange deities. Now, that would have really provoked their interest because they wanted to learn new things, especially things that they'd never heard before, right? They'd not heard of Jesus Christ, and they never heard of this resurrection that Paul was proclaiming, that Christ had done from the dead. This shows us that Paul was preaching the gospel, though, right? Because he was introducing these things to them. You know, the resurrection is really one of the most important parts of the gospel. We believe in a resurrected Christ. Turn over in your Bibles real quick to 1 Corinthians 15. I want to read this to you just since we're here on this topic. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul gives us some really good clarity about the resurrection. Turn over to 1 Corinthians 15. I'm going to read to you 12 through 19. It should also be on the screen. Starting in verse 12. Now if Christ is preached, if he's preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. Your faith also is in vain. Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God, because we testified against God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. So we can see here that it is extremely important to understand the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The resurrection of Jesus is one of the places that we find hope. It's one of the places that we find peace. Really, that's why that only the Christian, only the Christian truly has hope. Only the Christian truly has peace because the world cannot have that. They do not possess that. That's the thing that they're chasing after that we've been talking about that they can never find without Jesus, right? Jesus is their answer. You know, there's no certainty. There's no eternal life. There's no end of sin that we can witness. There's no Savior for us to behold if there is no resurrection. There is no resurrection. And if Jesus wasn't resurrected, then we would have no salvation whatsoever. And Jesus couldn't be trusted because he said that he would be raised from the dead. And it is an, it's a historical fact that Jesus Christ was indeed raised from the dead. And today, he's seated at the right hand of the Father. And we thank God for that. Let's look at verse 19. And they took him and brought him to the Oropagus, saying, May we know what this new teaching is which you are proclaiming. Now, the Oropagus here would have been a high place in the city. It would have been built on literally the highest point in the city. It's similar to a courthouse, but the law that was discussed was religious law and philosophical ideas. There had been a, a long-running idea that temples and worship places should be built on the highest place in any area in the ancient world. We can see that in many places in the Old Testament. So I want to read to you just one example real quick. In 2 Chronicles 14, 2 through 5, it says, Asa did good and right in the sight of the Lord his God, for he removed the foreign altars and high places, right? We're going to, you're going to see that word high places all through the Old Testament. You're going to understand here that this was a belief that they were trying to to be as close to God as they possibly could, right? So, and high places tore down and sacred pillars cut down the ashram 
and commanded Judah to seek the Lord God of their fathers and to observe the law and the commandment. He also removed the high places, there it is again, and the incense altars from all the cities of Judah, and the kingdom was undisturbed under him. So you see, high places were looked at as being holy because they believed that, you know, the higher you got, then the closer to God you were, right? That's, that was just the belief. They didn't take into consideration that God is omnipresent. You know, some Christians don't take that into consideration either. But that's something we should understand. God is with us. He's not far removed and just sitting up in heaven looking down on us, right? He's here right now with us, and he always is. It's, that's an important thing for us to understand as Christians. But even though we see here that the Oropicus was not a place of worship, it was the place where religious ideas and practices were introduced and also where they were sorted out. I think that maybe that is why that God, in his great providence, decided that Paul needed to preach a sermon in that place. Now, I think that's really interesting. We see that he's going to do that next time I preach. Um, and, we see, and also we see here that the, these Epicureans and these Stoics wanted Paul to present his teaching to all of the great thinkers in these two camps. And so they brought him out, out of the synagogue, out of the marketplace where he'd been preaching at, and they took him to the Oropicus. Now, I, I think that's a great opportunity, is it not? God really presented Paul with an amazing opportunity to preach to these great thinkers and philosophers during this time the gospel in hopes that some of these would become children of God. Well, let's look at verse 20 here. It says, For you are bringing some strange things to our ears, so we want to know what these things mean. Now it was the height of all things for these people to hear something new. To learn something that they never thought of or heard of before. How they probably believed that they'd heard it all. And in many ways, they probably had heard it all. At least all of the things that man could invent, right? That same view also seems to carry over from those people to us today. I've heard of seminaries that required graduating students to write a paper on scripture with a view that has never been taught before. Some new view, some strange new thing. You know, if there's anything that should keep you up at night, unable to sleep, it's that. Seminaries, training new pastors to find something new, a new idea that's never been taught before in scripture. You know, there's really no new things to be found in scripture. And when you hear something new, what you can rest assured is that it is a heresy that you're hearing. It's a heresy. Because you see, we find that all throughout church history, that what we're doing is standing on the shoulders of giants who all agree how the, the Bible must be interpreted. See, whenever a person believes that they found some new thing in the Bible, that millions of Christians over the course of over 2,000 years have never discovered, have never found, then what they have found is not anything new at all, but what it is is some old heresy that is just rearing its ugly head once again. So really what we should say here and understand and take away from this is never trust something new when it comes to Christian teaching. Last week I made a comment. I said, don't open your minds whenever I preach, right? Open your Bibles. Don't ever open your minds. Anytime somebody says open your minds, don't listen to that. Open your Bibles and compare what's being said in the name of God to Scripture. That's the way that we want to approach Scripture. Let's look at verse 21. Now all the Athenians and the strangers visiting there used to spend their time in nothing other than telling or hearing something new. Now we can see here that the Athenians and the strangers visiting were really just wasting their time. When a person is chasing after a false religion, it's a complete waste of time. You might as well be eating and drinking 
and being merry, for tomorrow we die. Because you see, all roads lead to hell except one. Jesus says this in Matthew 7, 13. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. And there are few who find it. You know, I find it tragic to learn of the great sacrifices that people have made throughout church history over false religion. People have given their money, sometimes all of it. People have given their property, their belongings. People have given their time and sometimes devoted their entire lives. People have even sacrificed their own children, literally, for false religion. People have killed, they've went to war, they've done some of the most wicked and vile things imaginable, all in the name of religion that will lead them to eternal damnation. It's, it's really strange how great a sacrifice that some people will make, yet they won't take the time to hear the gospel whenever a Christian is just trying to help them just wants to help them understand the truth. Now, why do you think that is? It's the same reason that people claim to be atheists or anything else to try to get away from the truth of the gospel. It's because they love their sin. They love their sin. That's the root of all of it. And from that, you can get into deception. You can get into cults and family religions and culture. But the root cause of all these things is that people love doing something sinful that they do not want to give up. And if you dig deeper into that, you'll find that what people really want is to be autonomous, to be able to make their own decisions, to be able to live the life that they believe is best for them, or they want to play the part of God and demand that people do things that God has never said that we must do. But you know, that makes us wonder, how can a blind person see the beauty of the mountains? How can an uneducated student teach in the university? You see, God has a perfect and beautiful plan for his creation. We can't see it if we love our blindness. We can't see it if we love the darkness. We can't learn it if we believe that we're their professor and that God is the student. You see, people love their sins and people hate God. That's why that salvation is a work of God himself and not of man. God uses us to present the gospel and the Holy Spirit does his work. But if they will not hear or if they do not hear, then they're going to be responsible for that on judgment day. So what is the gospel? What is the gospel? Well, we've touched many parts of it this morning. The gospel is that we are sinners, every one of us, that we all deserve punishment. And that is, according to scripture, the wages of death, the, the wages of sin is death. And that's talking about an eternal death in a place called hell. That's what everybody deserves because each one of us has, ca has caused treason. We've uprised against God himself. Right? And what that he said that we must do in order to be his creatures, in order to be his people. But God has created and and through his great providence and his plan a way of salvation for each one of us. And that way of salvation is through Jesus Christ, who came to this world. He came here, he lived the perfect life for us, he obeyed the law of God, and he went to the cross in order to pay our debts to God to take all of our sin that we've ever committed in this entire life upon himself as he was hung on the cross and killed. And whenever he died on the cross, his holiness and his righteousness was imputed to us if we believe in him, if we believe in God. And we, we can understand, we can see here that there's no way that we can be right with God any other way. We can't earn it. 
We can't come up with new philosophies, new ideas to be impressive to God. We can't, we're not going to ever impress him by our great intellect. We're not ever going to impress him by our great work ethic and by giving to charity and by trying to do good things. We can't earn salvation. There's no way to do that. The only way that we can be saved before God is to believe, right? To have faith. We say faith alone is how you're saved. And that's only through Christ alone. And it's only by the way that he's recorded in his scripture alone, right? He's given us the plan. He's told us what to do. He's told us what he's done for us. And it's something that we should be grateful for every day of our lives. So if you know him, then be grateful. Be grateful people. Thank him. Live your life for him. Follow him every day of your life. Don't chase after all of the idols that rear their heads up every day of our lives. Don't follow those things. Follow God. Live your life to glorify him, to be pleasing to him. He is a gracious God. Let's be grateful people. If you don't know him, today is the day to get to know him. Repent and believe. That's what scripture says to do. Let's pray.